as you see on the screen, my topic is quite uh, comprehensive. And uh, as a first speaker, it's my duty to make it really very fundamental so that everybody understands that uh, the complexity of the problem of and uh, of course, as a Western scientist, I will speak from the viewpoint of uh, the modern medicine, where biomedicine, as we uh, sometimes are saying. But uh, the main message will be, that, as I said already before, the biomedicine should, should be part of the, uh, the infertility treatment in the world of modern Next, please. And uh, before I start, I, I want to show some slides about my own university, which is the uh, University of Latvia, located in Riga, the capital of our country. It's a quite old university, and, and you see that the main building was uh, founded in 1869. It's really nice. Uh, Nice and a building and nice environment and it's a very classical university, research university, one of the best universities among seven best universities in the world. Okay. And uh, we are opening also some new uh, campuses and uh, just three years back that is the uh, campus for the, the building for the national sciences. Uh, many laboratories uh, also are there, and we are doing together with uh, Dr. Sommet uh, research on uh, it's, uh, on uh, Ayurvedic treatment for uh, diabetic fruit. And then um, uh, my also other population is the post Clinical University Hospital, which also has a recently uh, a very nice building. It's not on the same campus, but it's just uh, a few kilometers away. And uh, there I'm doing my clinical duties. I'm the head of the clinic for internal medicine. Next, please. This is a uh, uh, com compiled uh, slide showing uh, our development of Ayurveda uh, teaching at the university. And uh, it started uh, in 2012, so six years back. And you see Krishna Kumarji, the medical work, uh, the, the MD or Managerial director of the AVP, signing the, the first agreement doing a, a diabetes study together. And then uh, the, the Center for Complementary Medicine was opened next year at the University of Latvia. And you see that Dr. Indulal, as representative of uh, the AVP signed that uh, memorandum of understanding uh, together with the rector, you may say in India, the chancellor of the university, Southridge. And uh, Mrs. Bosse Harrison was very instrumental to really to create this, uh, not only the Center for Complementary Medicine, so the Center for Indic Studies and Culture at the University. She is in the middle. And uh, Professor Sipa Krabha was the founder of that center. But, but uh, this year we united both centers. And my my dream is, uh, is to create the research, international research institute for Indic uh, studies. And I very much hope that uh, 
this winter we will manage to do it. So the, the scientific work will include not only scientists from Latvia, my country, but also the whole globe, including India. That should be a very powerful uh, research institute. Next, please. So, uh, I should start about infertility. Then, uh, the first thing I should say is that we are living in really in times of really dynamic change. And uh, on the panel left, you probably can uh, see how the average fertility per women is decreasing in the world. And uh, in the middle of uh, the 20th century, uh, the average woman had uh, five uh, children. But nowadays, it's only uh, 2.5. And the prognosis is that uh, in the uh, quite near future, just in, uh, in 20, 30 years, it will decrease below the reproduction rate, which is 2.1. So that means that in 2050, the prognosis is that uh, the world population will start to shrink. And we, we see the same uh, trend in India. And, but there is uh, a lot of diversity uh, amongst the states of India. And in South India, you have the lowest uh, birth rate, according to, to the official statistics for the Registrar General of India. And for example, in Kerala, uh, 1.8 children per, uh, per women. But in Tamil Nadu, only 1.7. In contrary to the uh, Northern Indian states, for example, Bihar has still 3.4 children per So those uh, states with the uh, lowest uh, fertility are depicted in green, but with the highest in, in red. That is the, the map in the middle. And in the map on the right, you see sim similar uh, distribution of colors. But in uh, this case, the yellow color depicts the highest uh, rate of in vitro fertilization courses. In vitro fertilization is the artificial uh, fertilization of uh, women. Those who have uh, no other possibility to get uh, pregnancy. So the I IVF is becoming uh, popular not only in India but in the whole uh, world. The paradox is that uh, the states with the lowest fertility rate has the highest IV, IVF uh, course rates. And many of you, uh, families are ready to pay out of pocket huge sums of money to get pregnancy and outcome. And why is that? Because uh, there is still a social stigma for, for couples which uh, don't have uh, kids. And also in many countries, but probably not in the case of India, those families are not stable on that kids, or at least not so stable as uh, families with kids. So it is a growing problem. Uh, what about Latvia? We have a fertility rate 1.7, which is exactly the same fertility rate 
interested in your state in Tamil Nadu. But um, in contrast to Tamil Nadu, um, the fertility rate in Latvia was um, much lower than years back. And now it's slowly increasing. It used to be only 1.3 its per uh, woman. Now it's 1.7. So there's, as I said in the beginning, very dynamic trends. So the fertility rate can go up and, and down, and it very much depends from the society and also from the state of, of the medicine. Next slide. So, sorry for such a busy slide. I, I'm quite convinced that you cannot uh, understand this slide without explanation, but don't try even read what is there. <laughs> but my purpose showing this slide was just to show you how complex is the regulation of fertility on the metabolic and hormonal level. So, on, on the right uh, panel, you see how many factors, and those are mainly metabolic factors, are influencing the process of conceiving and pregnancy. You may see that many um, metabolites and vitamins and, uh, and other factors, uh, including genetics, are very complex process. So the purpose is to show you clearly how difficult in fact is getting pregnant. It's not an easy thing. Of it, uh, you see how many factors are influencing both male Regulation center in the human body. 
And uh, unsurprisingly, that uh, hypothalamus in the, on the top, through the pituitary gland, which is also very small gland, gland. the size is uh, approximately similar to the size of a you can imagine how small it is, but it has amazingly wide proportion of uh, the, all the human regulation, including the, the hormones which are regulating ovaries and uh, the, the pregnancy also. But as uh, the endocrine system is so complex, those cascades regulating ovaries are interacting, interplaying with other regulatory pathways, mainly with the adrenal axis or hypothalamic adrenal axis. So the stress hormones, catecholamines, are very much influencing the hypothalamus pituitary ovary axis. And that is quite clinically now a phenomenon that, that uh, those women which are under constant chronic stress have more difficulty get pregnancy. And you can, uh, by calming down, for example, there's a yoga, meditation, Ayurvedic procedures, really do a lot to calm down that uh, stress axis and to normalize the uh, reproductive axis. It's also true for the prolactin. Prolactin is the pituitary hormone which is like regulating lactation, breastfeeding. And if that hormone, prolactin, is high, it also interacts with that uh, HPG, hypothalamus pituitary uh, gonadal axis, and it is uh, suppressing ovulation. So women on breastfeeding are also temporary infertile, as you very, very much remember, or from your physiologist at least. So and the, the cause of it is that prolactin is a natural uh, contraceptive hormone, natural contraceptive which prevents the new pregnancy during the breastfeeding. It's very good for the health of the young mother. So the, the organs should be prepared for the next pregnancy. But unfortunately, there are several diseases, I will also speak about them, which are leading to increased levels of prolactin and infertility as a consequence. Next slide. So this slide shows you in, in very short uh, what is the normal physiology of uh, uh, fertility. And uh, I will try to show some nice pictures on each slide. And here you see in pink uh, one, one side of, of the female internal reproductive organs, a fallopian tube and uh, ovaries. And in, in, it looks to be like a flower. And the ovary is uh, generating eggs, one egg one menstrual cycle uh, during the whole reproductive period and fallopian tube 
at uh, think power is uh, kicking gum, <coughs> eggs, the ovulation in the middle of the cycle, and transporting it. And, and usually in the uterus, the, the insemination of the egg, the urine, because sperm, spermatozoids are traveling in the opposite direction. They are supposed to be in the fallopian uh, tube. And then and the fertilized egg is uh, moving forwards to the, the uterus where implantation takes place. So you see, it's also quite complicated. And uh, it's the age, the process of a regular uh, ovulation and uh, this transport of the egg is becoming more and more uh, complicated. So for, for fertility, it's also very important uh, to have a regular sexual intercourse. Uh, I should speak about it because many couples, especially young couples, don't understand properly uh, the physiology And they are desperately trying to get pregnancy, chaotic please. And uh, it's usually depleting the, the sperm quality if the sexual intercourse is chaotic. Several days, sometimes, uh, several times a day. And it's probably, you have to teach really where are the most probable which are the most common days the intercourse will lead to pregnancy. So the timing is also important. And the anterior needs, the fertilized egg needs um, of the uterus. That is an asset problem I will touch later on. Next please. So here on this slide I, I want to ask you, is it the correct uh, concept that uh, actually female infertility is based on uh, three basic categories. One is uh, on hormonal uh, status and uh, in my understanding, hormonal status is uh, what you may call in Ayurveda the vata part of the fertility process. And then uh, there are metabolic and inflammatory disorders which are preventing normal fertility and it's uh, similar to pita concept. And the third are anatomical problems in, uh, in, the, in the female body which are preventing uh, the structure which is preventing uh, conceiving, conceiving and, and fertility and it's similar to what in Ayurveda is understood under uh, Kapha, Kapha, this product. So I will in the next uh, few minutes uh, try to elucidate those three main uh, categories. They are separated by itself but are working together like also those dosa disbalances in uh, Ayurveda. Next please. So but before to do it um, I want to remind you the definition you should know already before. And uh, according to the World Health Organization, 
And fertility is defined as inability of a couple to conceive after one year of regular un unprotected intercourse. In some guidelines, it, it, it says, uh, some national guidelines, it says two years, but uh, internationally it's accepted. If during one year, the couple is not uh, getting their goal, then uh, we can call it infer infertility. Some uh, researchers are starting to argue, is it really infertility? Because it's a treatable, and uh, if it's treated successfully, then it's not anymore infertility. But therefore, the new term, subfertility, is, is coined. So subfertility is uh, something which is still promising. If it's failed after all efforts, then it's called uh, sterility. So if we should say to the couple, sorry, we tried everything, nothing was possible, so then we call it sterility. By the way, this uh, nice uh, diagram from uh, Wikimedia Commons uh, shows also that uh, the age is contributing a lot for <coughs> superfertility, sterility, and uh, uh, menstrual cycle irregularity, and finally menopause. So it starts from the age of the 20 uh, when the Probably early after after uh, an arc, yeah. when the fertility goes up, then it's, it, it reaches uh, maximum, and this is the cumulative uh, percentage of uh, successful uh, successful couples in terms of pregnancy. And, uh, and it reaches certain saturation uh, after 35. And then uh, it's, it's, become, it's becoming really difficult to get uh, pregnancy, especially in women which didn't have pregnancy before. So the same trend is for sterility and uh, irregularity and menopause. Uh, and by the way, also menopause, could there be early menopause? Here it's 41. And it, it could be late menopause, not 35. So it's also be different in different people. So about epidemiology, we, it is estimated that uh, Infertility currently is affecting uh, as many as 80 million couples in the Western uh, and uh, in worldwide, but in the Western countries, it's reached 15 percent. So imagine that in some countries, every sixth, every sixth, one to six couple is infertile. It's a huge and growing problem. Next, please. So this is my lovely slide I, I made by myself. And it shows, uh, according to one uh, big study published in good many journals, that uh, if we imagine that all infertility Causes are making hundred percent. Then it could be divided in uh, different subgroups. And the main subgroups for all causes are female causes, which is just over the half, fifty-eight percent. And male causes, one quarter, twenty-five percent. 
and then unexplained or unexplained causes seventy percent. And it's very important to remind you that uh, each investigation and treatment of infertile couple starts from the evaluation of the sperm of the male. So don't forget that uh, husband really contribute at least of, in uh, one quarter of uh, cases of infertility. It's very important to start with a, with a investigation of the, the males, which is much easier because the sperm is showing much very important if, uh, and if it's not uh, possible to analyze the sperm if it's not uh, giving you the ultimate answer you can even uh, do the biopsy of the testes which is also possible <laughs> what does it mean uh, unexplained uh, unexplained remains when we are very profound investigation don't find exactly the cause. Is it in, in uh, males or females? Many, many genetic defects are under this category. Many environmental factors, including uh, uh, pollution, is, uh, some endocrine disruptors. My colleague, uh, Dr. Chandrawali will touch this subject. He is uh, really leading to an unexplained cases. And the percentage of unexplained cases is also growing. So if we know that the cause is not uh, in male, uh, and we assume it's a female, then uh, there are, again, four different categories or different buckets. One is uh, ovulatory dysfunction, which contributes to almost one half, six, uh, 46 percent of cases. Then uh, tubal defect, also a large proportion, uh, 38 percent. Then uh, very modern disease, which is endometriosis 9% have you heard about this disease endometriosis it's quite uh, quite new newly recognized that it has a, such a contribution such a big contribution to infertility I, I will uh, I have a slide on this but uh, just to give you a clue how to start to think about that endometriosis. Ask, always ask, do you have a premenstrual, you know, middle, mid-term uh, pain camps? So if woman in the middle of the menstrual cycle has a, during the ovulation and, and after that, that has this bad feeling and uh, premenstrual cramps, it's a first sign that, you, that a woman may have endometriosis. I will come in, uh, come back to that later. And uh, unfortunately, other causes are contributing to 90%. Again, we know that uh, it should be a female factor for infertility, but despite of um, in this case, we cannot find it, or we find some very rare diseases. And I will also touch those diseases. Very rare diseases, usually endocrine diseases, like Cushing syndrome, acromegaly, autoimmune diseases, contributing to it. So, uh, Ovular dysfunction also can be divided in several subgroups, and uh, half of them are due to 
that uh, hypothalamic pituitary coronal axis disturbances. 50%. Then uh, homocystic ovary syndrome is a huge problem also. Similarly to endometriosis, it's a, it's a growing problem. And I know that today uh, several speakers will, will touch this uh, problem of uh, polycystic ovaries. It's not always polycystic ovary syndrome. Syndrome means that uh, it's covering uh, many pathologies actually, resulting in a singular clinical picture, but having different uh, pathogenesis, different development. Then, uh, premature ovarian failure, also increasing problem uh, due to stress, uh, uh, different drugs, used in treatment of other diseases and also environmental pollution stating the premature ovarian failure. Unfortunately, we have one wonderful test which is not used, still not used uh, uh, commonly, which is called anti bullerian hormone test. Very important. And modern uh, clinics really can uh, say, is it the case of premature ovarian failure or not? Just by testing this uh, anti mullerian hormone, AMG. And some uterine and also tract disorders, anatomic, anatomical problem again, also can be the cause of um, ovulation dysfunction. Next, please. So another busy slide, and I will not go into the details, but it's just to show you the diagnostic algorithms, which is uh, which are accepted currently, and um, I took it from the book for biochemical investigations in laboratory medicine published in, in uh, 2001. And uh, you see, every uh, investigation starts from analysis of uh, semen from partner. Start, start with a male, despite that you expect that from the female will be uh, the main cause, but always start with the main investigation. And then you have to take a good uh, history, analysis, as we say, in, in the medical language. And uh, there could be two different um, scenarios. One is a uh, woman with regular periods, and a woman with oligomenorrhea, sometimes amenorrhea. And in this case, always uh, check the anatomy by using ultrasound. Ultrasound really made a uh, revolution in uh, investigation of uh, human or female, also female, but only male, male uh, genital tract. We can really be quite uh, precise and say uh, everything is this one, all opium, tubes, healthy, Ovary is healthy, is uterus healthy, is the cervix healthy. So it should be done in, in early phase. Only then we can uh, do the hormonal checkup. That is the hormonal checkup. So different hormones as a uh, luteinizing hormone, LH, FSH, which stands for follicular. Follicular, follicular stimulating or prolactin uh, and uh, 3T3, which stands for the thyroid hormone. Yes. And 
then you will get different uh, combinations of answers. Uh, usually, if, if that quantum uh, axis is uh, impaired, the depth stage is high, and uh, usually it means that there is a ovarian failure or menopause, early menopause. And then you can say, sorry, we can, uh, it's really a difficult case. We should uh, do something different, not just uh, treatment or uh, with uh, hormones, for example. Uh, we can discover PCOS by doing those hormones. We can, we can discover uh, hyperprolactinemia, as I said, and uh, thyroid dysfunction, which also can lead to, in, because of interaction between those uh, hormonal axes. I showed in that very complicated slide is hormonal cascades. That interaction is also with the thyroid axis. Especially if, uh, if thyroid is, is uh, slow, it's called the uh, hypothyroidism. Human becomes very, also very slow, lethargic, that means she's sleepy very dry skin, coarse voice, she loses uh, uh, her hair, she basically is becoming puffy. Uh, those are the, the hallmarks of uh, I, marked hypothyroidism. So check the thyroid hormones also, especially if, if, if the patient has such a clinical picture. If I should concentrate on uh, the anatomy, the next slide, please. Uh, it's also depicted in, in that picture. You see many uh, anatomical irregularities in the uh, in uterus, in ovaries, and in, in the tube, fallopian. So, let's start from the tubal defects. A damaged or blocked fallopian tubes keep the sperm from getting to the egg or block the passage of the fertilized egg into the uterus. You see, if, if such a block occurs here, like here, uh, it's natural that at least that ovary is blocked. And, and you cannot expect that, uh, despite of ovulation, uh, the, uh, the pregnancy will be there. Uh, what are the causes of uh, fallopian tube damage? Uh, first of all, pelvic inflammatory disease, and uh, it's also quite common, especially if uh, if the sexually transmitted infections are there. And uh, usually it happens in uh, couples with a prom promiscuous uh, lifestyle. If, if male or female has uh, several partners, so then uh, the risk for sexually uh, transmitted the infections is higher. And if it's chronic, leading anatomical changes in, in uh, not only in uterus but also fallopian tubes and uh, even ovaries. There are specific uh, bacteria like chlamydia, also gonorrhea, indeed. Uh, uh, gonorrhea usually is easier to diagnose as a chlamydia. Chlamydia intracellular uh, uh, pathogen could uh, really be difficult to diagnose. You, you need special tests to diagnose it. So previous surgery, not only on genitals, but also in the abdominal area, could be 
complete uh, block of uh, Colombian tubes work. And also pelvic tuberculosis. In the Western world, it's going down, but I know that the worldwide still the tuberculosis is there, especially among uh, the poor people. We have always to remember that suspected tuberculosis in difficult uh, cases. And uh, if you remember that uh, tuberculosis still exists, then it's easy to diagnose, but you have to remember Because tuberculosis can really mask. It's not an easy disease to discover. Next slide. So coming back to endometriosis, as I said, it's a growing problem. Uh, and since doctors recognize that it is uh, uh, in a high proportion of infertility cases, and also that research is, uh, is going on on this disease. And what is it? What is it? It occurs when tissue that normally grows in the uterus, it's the internal layer, endometrium. So those cells, if they are starting to grow in other places, like in ovaries, like in fallopian uh, tubes, like in abdominal cavity, then we call it endometriosis. And as I said, the hallmark is the premenstrual syndrome. It's not always that uh, women having that syndrome have uh, endometriosis, but it's the first hallmark we have to start thinking of. Endometriosis. So that uh, extra tissue growth and also the surgery which is uh, sometimes necessary to unlock the fallopian tubes, uh, lead to, uh, to scarring and deformities. And uh, then uh, again, the, that anatomical problem is not solved, but it's sometimes even worsening. So don't uh, try to operate, do surgery, first of all, if, if the surgeon is not experienced. And secondly, if you are not convinced that there are other means to treat endometriosis. So, uh, the spots of endometriosis are depicted with red. It's showing that there are those spots are bleeding when uh, menstrual bleeding is really says you much if you can imagine that it's a part of uh, endometrium <coughs> in different other untypical places which are those cells are still following the hormonal stimulation including the bleeding in the second period second part of the menstrual cycle So, finally coming uh, to the ovulate ovulate hair dysfunction causes. You see, uh, also, there are many causes. So, problems with the regulation of reproductive hormones is uh, starting in hypothalamus, pituitary gland. Could be also in ovary. And uh, could be divided in uh, four bigger parts. If, if we find that uh, ovaries are involved, you see uh, many small follicles which are there, we call it polycystic ovaries, but uh, 
Remember, not always polycystic ovaries means that this is polycystic ovary syndrome. What is causing PCOS is still uh, not, uh, not uh, precisely now, but, uh, but we, can, we, we may say it's a hormonal disbalance. And uh, it's definitely associated with insulin resistance and obesity. So the more obese are women, the, the higher uh, probability that they have will have a PCOS. But it is not excluding also PCOS in, in a lean patients. So it, it says you that, that the pathogenesis of this syndrome is very complicated itself. And Dr. Chandra will involve this people later in the next lecture. Then uh, hypothalamic dysfunction, and as I said, FSH and LH are, uh, are regulating from hypo hypothalamus to gonadal function. And uh, physical and emotional stress that interaction with the uh, paternal axis it could uh, really damage that normal regulation. Also, very high or very low body weight. Very high, we say that body mass index is over 30 kilograms per meter square. So, it's a obesity. Or below body mass index, below 17 kilograms per meter square. If, if you know the formula, it's very easy to calculate the body mass index. So the whole, the, the women at risk are if BMI is below 17 and above 13. So premature ovarian failure, all ovarian, ovarian insufficiency, and uh, it could be of uh, different causes, as I said, but uh, could be also autoimmunity, and especially in the Western world, it, different reasons, autoimmune diseases are really increasing. And I think also in Indians. The pollution of the environment is contributing to increased autoimmunity, but also an increase of, um, of uh, viral infections, uh, different unusual foods are main contributors to, to increased autoimmunity. But autoimmunity can also affect ovaries. It's very well known. You can even measure ovarian ovarian antibodies in the laboratory. But usually it's combined with other uh, autoimmune diseases because uh, autoimmunity is, is a systemic disease affecting other systems as well. So the combination of this type 1 diabetes, for, for example, is, is well known, is rheumatoid arthritis. Always uh, think about autoimmunity if uh, there are other autoimmune diseases in the female. So also uh, genetics. So there are different uh, genetic diseases which could lead to premature uh, menopause or ovarian. You can even uh, sometimes see in, in the family that mother had early menopause, grandma, grandmother had, grandmother's sister. So you have to ask about the age of menopause in that family. If it's uh, low, then it might be a genetic cause. Uh, chemotherapy is also increasing cause for 
when we failure, especially in, in patients with cell treatment, cancer treatment, but also in patients with uh, uh, treatment of different autoimmune diseases, for example, lupus. rheumatoid arthritis. So there are heavy uh, allopathic drugs which could damage potential also of what very much. Always remember, but for that you need a proper history data, right? Too much prolactin or, or hyperprolactinemia say in endocrinology. The pituitary gland uh, is producing too much prolactin, which is just for uh, the breast lactation, but if it's outside of this paper, we call it uh, hyperprolactinemia pathologic disease, non-physiologic state, which can cause uh, prolactinemia. The causes could be different. The main cause is a uh, benign tumor pituitary called prolactinoma. But also remember that many drugs, usually psychotropic drugs, antidepressants, uh, and other drugs used, for example, for the treatment of depression or schizophrenia, can also uh, damage uh, ovary population and lead to premature cohort and failure. Next. So other problems. Now I will touch very short uh, other rear diseases. Because those rear diseases are diseases making a lot of headache for fertility clinics. Because they are usually are focused very much on common diseases. So, but a good doctor is the doctor who is able, capable to recognize real disease and diagnose it and treat it. That is one of the characteristics of a good, of a good doctor who understands also real conditions. Next please. I said real conditions but actually aging not a rare condition. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as I said before, uh, with aging, fertility, fertility rate is decreasing. And uh, on this slide, you see this uh, diagram. It shows uh, the per month chance of conception. How much uh, is the chance that uh, by regular sexual intercourse that couple will get uh, successful pregnancy? And uh, in young people, that is the age of 22, it's 25 percent. There's a 25 percent chance that in that month they will get uh, pregnancy. Never 100% chance. So with the age, it's decreasing uh, initially quite slowly till the age, uh, let's say, 28. Afterwards, it's declining uh, quite linearly till the age 38, 40, and then sharply going. The main problems is in infertility is that are occurring in, uh, in females over 40 years of age. So remember, if you have a patient who is coming to you for Ayurvedic treatment of infertility, and the age is over 40, so don't promise everything. It's a really difficult task. But possible because uh, still over 40, the chance is not zero. 
it becomes zero after uh, menopause. Of course. Five minutes left. Then uh, next please. Uh, yeah, before come back about infertility. In, uh, nowadays, uh, uh, many doctors, allopathic doctors, are sending just away patients to the fertility clinic if they are rich couples, right? Uh, and they promise everything, especially in uh, advertising. Usually there are nice uh, pink babies and very happy parents they want birth. How is really the, the success rate for IVF? Uh, for women aged uh, 20, uh, 35 to 39, percentage is uh, only 16.9 once. So it's not uh, Don't promise, but you cannot do it, even with a big money. It's like a major and for women uh, between 40 and 44, it was just 6.6. Uh, Imagine that how tiny proportion of people be successful is IVF. Don't uh, make false promises. Body weight, uh, I already explained how the body weight over 30 kilograms per meter square is in influence. And uh, in obese, it's, uh, it's because of, usually because of uh, insulin resistance and disturbances in uh, leptin and uh, other hormonal axes. Interestingly, uh, in obese women, you always should start with a weight loss device. It's the proper Ayurvedic diet leading to weight loss. And in, in some studies, it's shown that even 5% loss of body weight is increasing uh, fertility. So always start with a diet and lifestyle exercise, yoga. So I, I am already touched the subject of uh, the pelvic pneumatoid disease. And uh, the main message is that uh, don't always uh, expect that the uh, patient will have uh, many symptoms. Or the symptoms could be vague if, uh, if uh, there is a case of uh, some strange bacteria called uh, Lamedia. Others. But you always have to remember infection. Next, please. Uterine and cervical cause is easy to detect with a sensitive ultrasound. It could be, uh, should be transvaginal ultrasound on the, on the inside. Then you can really find the tumors or polyps, fallopian tubes, or endometriosis, or uterine abnormalities uh, on the birth, and cervical stenosis. Next, please. Some uncommon causes, uh, if I allow to show some. Final slides. I promise not more than five. Because I, uh, as an endocrinologist, I really meet such people with severe endocrine uh, causes for, for infertility. One of the causes which are uh, clinically quite easy to detect is uh, estrogen, uh, sorry, androgen excess. Female also have uh, male hormones, actually in abundance. Testosterone.
from in Finland, the, concentra the concentration is higher than estradiol. It's quite interesting. Not many, uh, even uh, doctors, uh, remember that uh, women have a higher levels of androgens than estrogens. But of course, those uh, androgens are not acting because of, of uh, androgens so explicitly, like in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in males. So, uh, what are those? Main pathologies leading to androgen excess are tumors, or ACNs, which stands for androgen secreting um, neoplasms, and Cushing syndrome, acromegaly, and a genetic disorder, which is called non classical hyperplasia, and some drugs can induce hyperandrogenism and se severe insulin resistance, which is also a genetic symptom. Next, please. That is the word we work, work up, or to exclude the uh, Cushing syndrome and uh, congenital adenal hyperplasia. Next, please. So, Cushing syndrome, if you have you seen Cushing's syndrome patients in your body? Some of you say yes. Remember, in endocrinology, many diseases are very typical in appearance. If you now have disease, then you will next time recognize them. So, but in order to, to do it, you have to see many patients. And uh, that is one picture of the same the same girl, changing uh, face appearance so before disease, during um, acute disease period, and after treatment. You see how the face is changing in uh, Cushing syndrome patients. It's becoming red and round. It's a uh, hirsutism. means a male kind of, uh, of uh, Appears on the, on the face, but also on the, on the abdominal area, in the abdominal area, on the back. And uh, remarkably, if you see the, the belly, and in India it's easier to see the belly in patients, if they are very sorry. But uh, it's not so nice picture, it's such a pink. Not a purple stream. That is uh, quite typical of Cushing's. The face is clear. And uh, in many cases, they have fertility problems, those patients. How to, how to treat them? It's by microsurgery or the pigeon implant, which is responsible in 70% uh, of cases. The rest are either in, in adrenals, if you are in adrenals, you can see it in ultrasound, or unfortunately sometimes it's a malignant that you work somewhere, in the, most commonly in the mind. So then the prognosis is, 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 is worse. Next please. Acromegaly, also typical appearance in the face. Face is uh, becoming like in this moment. So it's a it's a grow uh, with a very thick skin, coarse voice, oily skin, and also enlargement of hands and uh, feet. My question always is: Do you still wear your old uh, shoes, for example? Not the uh, but we have old time also. Close. If they are saying that the uh, old shoes are too small for me, then uh, it seems to be that the uh, acromegaly is possible. And uh, those hands are not difficult for you know, women. If you see male like 
hands. Uh, female always expect uh, to make them. Also, the tongue is becoming uh, very large, and uh, the teeth are bigger. So there are spaces. Those are critical hallmarks of the severe disease. If you recognize sacromegaly, you immediately understand how the treatment should be. The treatment is surgery or uh, hormon, hormonal therapy. Next, please. <coughs> then, uh, malignancies, pathogen <coughs> secreting tumors. Usually, you should. You should you should suspect those neoplasms if uh, those, those symptoms are like uh, hirsutism or boldness in people are de developing rapidly over one year, for example, and always suspect malignancy, which can cause uh, hyperandrogenism, too much male hormones and infertility. But unfortunately, uh, CT scan is very useful to discover if you remember that such a diagnosis exists. These are ovarian uh, neoplasm in the pelvis, and this is other normal neoplasm in, uh, in the retro. So drug-induced hyperandrogenism is probably not common in, uh, in India, still not common, but in the Western world, especially among bodybuilders, some big females also can get a very masculine body, I should say, as in this picture. So they are using uh, anabolic hormones Naturally, even with a lot of exercise, you cannot achieve such a muscle mass. Unfortunately, those bodybuilder women are infertile, but also males are, men, men are becoming infertile. That is the paradox. They are taking a lot of uh, androgens, they are sexually active, but infertile is that artificial hormone is blocking the natural regulation, the natural hypothalamic between the gonadal axis. And finally, uh, becoming not, not clear anymore, are different drugs and, and, and environmental pollutants which could uh, decrease fertility. And uh, besides anabolic steroids, cytosporin, uh, cataconazole, which is used against uh, fungal infections, uh, anti-epileptic drug, which is called valproic acid, uh, also spironolactin, which is used for the heart failure treatment, all those allopathic drugs can decrease fertility and it will increase the, uh, the chance that the uh, patient is unable to get pregnancy. A lot of different drugs have to always ask which allopathic drug, which allopathic drugs. I will kindly know. Allopathic drugs are your patient. Is your patient. Next, please. And also, not only medicines, allopathic, but also smoking and alcohol abuse, which is increasing, increasing as I know, also in India. So, if excessive abuse of alcohol is decreasing fertility. Mainly in men, 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 also in female. Those infertile couples, you should ask 
what are the drinking habits of your husband? Don't hesitate. Next, please, and until there is Then, uh, got this severe uh, uh, genetic disease, appearing in the lower uh, steroid synthesis in the other known cortex, called congenital adenomyopathy. Usually, you always uh, remember from your medical studies, uh, it's affecting newborns, but so-called non-classical form, milder form, would lead to infertility in the female. You have to always check it because uh, there, there are unfortunately not so many clinical hallmarks uh, for this disorder. You may expect it in uh, patients with a low blood pressure. Stress and Next, please. I have a blood was already explained, but uh, that is a picture of Galactorea. Greek word means uh, the flow of milk, which is not uh, because of breastfeeding, but just uh, also. If, if your patient is complaining about malaria, always check the product. Next, please. Hypothyroidism was already explained. Stress induced uh, infertility was explained. And this third chronobiology, especially in the Western world, is an increasing problem. People are not respecting anymore Dinacharya. Um, standing up, celebrating during the night, making night shifts, sleeping during the day, it's also damaging that. The whole regulation system, which is so complex. So always ask about the dinacharya, your infertile patients. It's time to conclude now. This is about PCOS, which will be explained by Dr. John Hermelin. Fertility, infertility tests. I am IMG test, I am H test, which stands for anti-Tularian hormone. Remember, it's a whole message that that test is very good for regulation of the ovarian reserve and, and uh, say really, are there any follicles left? Fertilization, allopathic fertilization drugs are many. Will not touch them all, but uh, homophen for induction of ovulation, gonadotropins, also metformin in obese people, and uh, letrozole.